Be a sanctuary. 
even though I gave my heart to the Lord 26 years ago, about 11 and a half years ago, I made a commitment to my Lord, my Savior, that everything that is written in this book, I'm never going to doubt, and I'll always believe word of word. Now, sometimes people say, well, if you're a Christian, you should believe it. I think if you ask every Christian, whether they've been in church 50 years or five days, do you believe in everything in here? And they would say yes. Yes. But in their own mind, their own spirit, I think a lot of them would question things. They'll question things. But when you come to totally surrender everything to God, we may not know what's going to happen tomorrow. We may not know where we're going to, how we're going to even eat tomorrow. We may not know where we're going to live tomorrow. But we totally surrender everything to God and say, Lord, I don't know, but I'm going to trust in you fully. Amen. I'm going to trust in your holy word fully. Every word that is written in here, Amen. I'm going to take and trust and believe in it. When I started to do that, there were some other changes in my life, and that's going to be tonight's message. I was going to break forth the message this morning, but God already changed it as we were up here. So and we're going to let God have his way this morning. But this is God's holy word. Where would we be without Jesus? Where would we be without his word? You know, we have something the early church didn't have. You know, Jesus said, search the scriptures and you'll find me. Search the scriptures. Now, he wasn't talking about the Bible that we know of today. He was talking about the Old Testament, the Torah, the first five books that were written. Search the scriptures, you'll find me. Today, we can find him in every page from Genesis to Revelation, praise God. He's in every page, praise God. These are his love letters. These are his instructions for us. So the reason why the word of God doesn't get in our heart sometimes, Sister Sheila, is that we don't get into the word of God. We need to constantly be in the word of God. I listen to the preachers, and I hear this all the time on TV. That's not enough. I listen to the TV, and uh, I get a mail order. That's not enough. You need to get and read the Bible yourself. You need to open it up, praise God. I'm not going to mention the denomination, but for many, many, many years, the church, this particular church, would not advocate the congregation to read the Word of God. I'm being serious. They would not advocate reading the Word of God, and the Word of God was actually done in a different language when they read it and did their sermons. The reason for that, I, I tell everybody, investigate. Don't take my word for anything. Search the scriptures. Search yes, what's yes, out there. Stop. Don't take my word for anything. The reason why they did that, they felt the average person was too ignorant to understand what God wrote. You know what? We're not too ignorant. We're not too ignorant at all. We can open up the Bible and see God's word, and not only does it touch us, not only does it change us, it makes us more alive than we ever have before. For it is alive, it is spirit, it is truth, praise God. That's not the message, that's just a little icing on the cake this morning, <laughs> praise God. Thank you, sweet Jesus. But I want you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 9, if you will. I think we're going to be staying in John with a few other scriptures I'll point out. We're going to start with John 9-1. Say amen when you're there. Sometimes we go through a lot of bad things. The Bible tells us, Count it all joy when you run into different divers of temptation. That doesn't mean trouble. Sister Carol's got her troubles. She's got her trial. She has surgery tomorrow. Tony, you have your trials because you're supporting her, you're helping her. We know Sister Mary has trials, many trials. We know that Brother Nelson has many trials. You know, he has things going on in his life that you may not even be aware of. I know you have many trials, brother. And you all have many trials. Amen. Sister, I know you, you, you've had a battle in your hand this past year and a half. you got trials. I have trials. But the Bible tells us to count it all joy. Sometimes we think because we have trials that God has turned away from us. God has not turned away from you. When you have a trial, we, you know why we count it all joy, Tony? Because God is going to get glory out of that if we are obedient to him and if we let him lead and guide us. He's not going to get glory out of it if we put our own self in, our own two cents in, and try to change things and do it our way. But we say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I put all my trust in you, so no matter what, Lord, you're the one. You're, you're, 
It's like being on a train ride. We're going to go wherever that train goes. And wherever God takes us, we're going to go. We're going to go through the swampy areas. We're going to go through the dry areas. We're going to go through the blessed areas. You know, we may be in a valley on that train. We may be in a mountaintop on that train. But wherever God is taking us is to help us become more like him. Amen. It's to help us purge what's inside of us out. It's to help other people see how God has changed your life. Hallelujah. Because people will then have hope that if God can do it for this man, God can do it for this woman. If God can do it for this woman, God can do it for this child. If God can do it for this child, God can do it for this couple. Amen. And he does it for his glory. Amen. Sometimes we get in the way. We get in yes. the midst of things. Hallelujah. We know the Bible says that the rain falls. In other words, it falls on the just and the unjust. Whether you're good, saved, or indifferent, or bad, you know what? It's going to fall on you. The sun shines on the just and the unjust. I remember talking to a sister, and I'm not going to mention her name. She comes here at times, and we were having a Bible study not far from here and at their house, and, and she would get so mad. She said, you know the people four doors down? They got a brand new car. They put a brand new pool behind their house. And, 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 and you know what? That pool is so big it covers their whole lawn. And they're going to Disney World with their kids. And she goes, my husband can't even get his car fixed. And we're church going people. What's wrong with that? That's not right. I said, sister, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the unjust will get rewarded. Not because of God, but it's just how things are. Mm -hmm. So the rain is going to fall on the just and the unjust, but the sun will also shine on the just and the unjust. So when the unjust gets more than what you're getting, don't, don't think that God's forgotten about you. Don't think that God has pushed you aside. God is still God. But you know what? When we're going through our problems, do we still honor Him? Yes. When we're going through our bad situations, do we still give Him glory? Yes. That's the test that we have as Christians. Do you still honor him when you're in the valley? Or do you just praise him when you're atop of the mountain? Do you still give him glory when you're when you're down in the mullet grass? Or, or do you just give him glory when you're going up? We need to give him glory in all situations. We need to give him glory and honor him in all aspects. Someone say, even if it meant losing a limb, even if it meant being crippled, even if it meant being paralyzed, even if it meant losing your home, or, 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 or losing everything you've worked for, the answer to that is yes. To give him glory and say, no matter what, I still honor you. No matter what, I still give you praise. No matter what, you're worthy to be praised. Why? Because he's God. Chapter 9 of the Gospel of John. And as Jesus passed by, I love it when I read as Jesus passed by or passes <laughs> by because you know something's going to happen. Yes. When Jesus passes by, Brother Tony, coming. something always happens, Brother Hallelujah. Richard. Yeah. And Jesus passed by and he saw a man which was blind from his birth. I want you to listen to this. He was blind from his birth. This man did nothing wrong. He was a child. He was a newborn child, but he was blind from his birth. Now he's probably in his 20s or his 30s. And his disciples, Jesus' disciples, asked Jesus, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that was born blind? Obviously, the man couldn't have sinned. He was born in sin. But he was a child. He was blind when he was born. But here's what Jesus answered. Neither has this man sinned nor his parents. Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made a manifest in him. In other words, this man didn't sin. His parents didn't sin. But you know what? God is going to do something. He's going to manifest for his glory. And we know that's about to happen. Yes, because God. when Jesus passes by, something always good happens. Amen. I've shared it numerous times over the years. Sister Mary was on the other side. She came over. We weren't even cooking at that time. We were just getting the church ready. And a young lady that we loved came in. And she had a little boy about 12 or 13 at that time. And he had come in for... With, he had come down with Bell's palsy, and, and her words to us was this, what have I done? And this is a good woman. What sin did I do to have God put this in my child to give him Bell's palsy? I don't know if you know what Bell's palsy is. Your face turns around, and I had it one time. I looked like Popeye the Sailor Man. My eye couldn't close. I had to wear a black patch over my eye. My mouth was drooping. It looks like it took a stroke. And, and uh, they had said it was going to be a 
maybe a, a, a years or the rest of my life looking like that. They were going to start treatment on me. But I tell you what, I just had gotten saved. I went to a little church over here, a little garage church not far from here. Dave and Angie Reynolds' little church. They prayed for me. And, and I tell you what, two weeks later, my ugly face was back to normal, praise God. God doesn't put things on us. We're in a fallen world. Amen. This is what we told this young lady. And we prayed. And her child was restored. <laughs> God's not going to punish you. God's not going to punish your children. And this woman did nothing wrong. But the first thing we do, we start to think, we must have done something wrong. I must have did something wrong. I was going to bring Job into the previous message that I'll share tonight. I remember Job's friends even saying, you must have done something wrong for God to have done all this. Your children must have done something wrong. And you know what the Bible said? Sister Mary, I just read this and I've read it over, but it just hit me. God came in a whirlwind and he spoke to his friends. And you know what he told his friends? He said, who are you to speak? I'm putting it in modern terms. Who are you to speak? And he tells them, Tony, shut up. This is God speaking to his friends. Shut up. Alabado Dios. They were speaking wrong. You don't need friends like that. You, you need friends to look you up. You don't need friends to, to say you've done something wrong. You don't need friends to condemn you. Come on now. But sometimes that's how we do, unfortunately. And look what it says here in 4. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh where no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. How many people know he's the light? And the Bible says, that, and when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. In other words, he spit on the ground and he made clay of the spittle. He, had, he, had, he moistened the, the ground, the clay, with his own spit. And he covered the man's eye and put it on the man's eye. He anointed Anointing means to smear. So he smeared it over the man's eye. And he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Salaam. Amen. I started to think when I heard this many years ago, why did he tell the man to go wash? All God had to do was think, and all God had to do was speak it, and the man would have been healed. But he wanted the man to do something else here. And sometimes this is what he's saying to us. He's saying to us, Brother Nelson, you know what? I've already done my part to heal you. Now it's your time. time. Go and wash a little bit. Go and get cleaned up a little bit. Wash off the dirt that's on you right now. And thank God he did. Thank God he did. Because what does it say? He went his way therefore and washed. And he did what? Came, sing. He came, sing. He could see. He had his eyesight back. And some of the folks, you know, they didn't understand this. In verse 9 he said, you know, is this he? And it's like him. And the man said, I am he. I am he. Therefore they said unto him, how were thine eyes open? How were your eyes open? Every one of us, and as a Christian here, your eyes have been opened. I hear this all the time anymore. The, the woke generation, the work system, woke society, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, let, let's wake up, world. Let's allow all these things to happen in the church today. Let's all have all these things happen in society today. The world has turned upside down. The Bible says that what was good is going to be called bad, and what was bad is going to become good. But the world takes it as a good thing. I've been woken up. Well, no, they, they're not woken up. They're woken up with the flesh. We need to be waken up by Jesus Christ. We need to open up our eyes and have him touch us and to change us. Because truly as a Christian, can we see what's going on? Truly as a Christian, when our eyes are open, we see that the old way of life was not the way to be. We've been changed. Not just with our eyes, but with our heart, praise God. They called his parents in a little bit later. And they said, is this your son? How can he see? Mm -hmm. And the parents were afraid to be thrown out of church. And they said, you know what? He's of age. Ask him. And they did ask him. And he said, I met a man called Jesus. He touched me. I washed. And I could see. And they said, you know what? This man is a sinner. This man is healing on the Sabbath. Nobody can heal but God. This man is a sinner. And, and, I, and I love what it says here in verse 25. And he answered. The man said, whether he be a sinner or not, I know not. But one thing I know, whereas I was blind, but now I see. But now I see. 
seeing God work, seeing God, precious Lord God, work. Thank you, sweet Jesus. Glory. Amen. Glory a Dios. Hallelujah. I want you to turn to chapter 15, if you will, for a moment of John. Chapter 15, Sister Mary John. I pray to the world today, and those on Facebook, and those that are in the church today, I pray that our eyes become more open by God. Amen. I pray that he touches us, because only after he touches us can our eyes truly be open. We can't open them up on our own. So when we can open them up and start to realize what he's doing and who he is, and we truly accept him as Lord and Savior of our life, great and mighty works will happen for his glory, not for our glory. Chapter 15 of, of John, Jesus says this, starting with verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purged it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Listen to that. What helps us become clean? Ye are clean through what? Hallelujah. The Word. Amen. We are clean through what? The Word. Yes. Through the Word, which I have spoken unto you. Amen. Someone says, how do I clean up my life? I can't do it on my own effort. Says, you never will do it on your own effort. But you need to put in some effort. You need to put in a willingness to surrender to God. You need to put in a willingness to surrender to Him everything. You need to put in a willingness to hear the Word of God. You need to put in a willingness to take it into your heart. And once we start doing that, there's a change that's going to take place. There's a cleansing that takes place. So many times I hear, and I'm sure, Sister Sheila, you've heard this before, and I know you've heard it, and I know you've heard it. All of you have heard it. It's so hard to be a Christian today. i got all these evil thoughts, and i got all these desires, and I, and I do such wicked things. You know what? Every Christian, well, I don't care if you're 100 years old or 200 years old, everybody's still going to have a battle up here. But you know what? I can put those thoughts out. I can fight those thoughts out with the power of God's holy word. Amen. So I'm saying, what do you do, Pastor? Who do you go to? What do you What do you do when you have thoughts of hurting someone or doing this or perversion or whatever? So you know what? I've turned to the book of God. When I get his word inside of here, when I get his word inside of here, those thoughts go. In the name of Jesus, the devil needs to go. Hallelujah. So we're clean through what? The word which I have spoken unto you. Listen to this. Abide in me, and I in you. Live in me, and you live in me, and I live in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except it abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. Not, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. I love number seven here, 15 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. In other words, if you live in me, and my words live in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Asking in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. But you know what? We can abide. If we don't abide, we can ask all day long. Guess what? Nothing's going to happen, Sister Sheila. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to happen at all. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. This is going to take us to the last part of our sermon here, praise God. And I want you to turn to chapter 9 of John. Alabado Thank Jesus. you, sweet Jesus. And we're going to talk about the ship. Yeah, we talked you. about this a while back. Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side. And I've said this many a time. When he tells us something, we can bank on it. 
So because you're going to the other side, you're going to the other side. If you're going to be healed, you're going to be healed. If you're going to be delivered, you're going to be delivered. But how many people know that we have to believe that too? The Bible says, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be open. In the 11th chapter of Mark, it says that when you ask, believe that you've already received it, and you shall what? Have it. Listen to what it says here. Jesus always knows you're going to have problems. We were watching a video before church today, and I had the guys watching, and, and uh, it was just showing that Jesus is always with us through the good times and through the bad times, through the hard times, difficult times, and the joyful times. He's always with us. And we can understand that, that we're never alone. We should never be afraid. And we understand that if he tells us to do something, it's going to get done. He's given us the power and authority to do that, praise God. Because if we're abiding in him, we can ask what we will, and it should be given to us. We just read that. Listen to what happened to the disciples here. Let me set this up. They just had a big meal not too long before that. Jesus fed 5,000 people. We know the story. There was a boy that had a couple little fishes and about five little loaves of barley bread. And all these people came to hear Jesus speak that day. And a lot of them came just out of curiosity, but they came anyhow. That was good. That's like church. We don't care why they come. Just come. Come. And maybe that Amen. word will go and find good soil. Amen. So Jesus picks up the basket and, and, uh, and, and, and his basket like this. And he ended up put, putting the, the fish and the bread in a basket. And he lifted it up and he gave thanks. And then he started to distribute this to the disciples. Amen. Okay. Then in turn, the disciples took the little bit of fish and a little bit of bread, and they distributed to 5,000. Now, this is 5,000 men that we're referring to, but the reality is there could have been up to 15,000 or more people there. They didn't count the women back in those days, and the children weren't counted, so there could have been 15,000 people there. But they only had two little fish, and, and, and five little loaves of barley bread. And this was from a little boy, which means that was his lunch. You know, he didn't have a big meal he was carrying with him. This was his little lunch box. But they took this, and Jesus blessed it. But once his blessing is upon this, he gives it to the disciples. And here's the thing I want to get across. Jesus blessed it. God blessed it. Amen. But who distributed it? Amen. Who put it out there? The disciples put it out there. Hallelujah. The disciples delivered it. The disciples gave it to the people. Glory. That's what our job is. We're disciples of Jesus Christ. You are God's hands, you are God's feet, and you are God's mouthpiece. Amen. Remember that. That's how we become a good witness. We, we work. We work our faith. We don't just speak it. We work it. We work oh, our yeah, faith, praise God. Hallelujah. Be the mouth of Jesus Christ. Be the hands and feet of oh, Jesus. Yes. Come on. Yes. You know, so we go out there and we help the poor. We help the hungry. We pray for those that are in need. We help the elderly. We do whatever needs to be done. We change somebody's flat. We cut their grass. Whatever needs to be done. But we have to understand when people say, well, where's God? He's right here in this room today. God is inside every one of us. Come on. That's what gets us up. That's what gets us going. That's what keeps us going, praise God. God blessed it. God blessed you. God anointed you. In 1 John it says the anointing is already upon you. We already have his anointing. We already have his glory. It's already upon us. We need to stand up in faith and say, Lord, I don't need anybody else. I don't need this. I don't need that. It'd be great to have the help, but you know what? If you've given me this blessing, I'm going to use my mouth. I'm going to use my hands. I'm going to use my feet until I can't use them anymore to bless others. The Bible. The Bible. The Bible wants us to be blessed so we can bless others. So that day, those 12 disciples fed 5,000 to 15,000 people. They were just doing what God asked them to do. Lord. Distributing food. Amen. But you know what God wants us to do right now? He wants us to distribute spiritual food. Amen. Spiritual Amen. food. So you're never going to run out, Amen. Sister Mary. You're never going to run out, Tony. You're never going to run out, Sister Mary. We're going we're gonna to distribute that spiritual food. Come on. We might look around and say, there's only 10 of us. There's only 12 of us. It doesn't matter if there's only one of you. 
You know what? If there was only one disciple that day, that disciple would have passed that out to all 5,000 or 15,000 people. Listen to what I'm saying today. God will always put an increase. His word will go forth and accomplish what it was intended to do. Praise God. Yes. So 5,000 to 15,000 people ate that day because God blessed it, but we, the workers, distributed it. Amen. I want to point that out. This has already taken place before they get on the boat. But how many times has God delivered you out of a situation? How many times has he blessed you? How many times has he healed your body? And we soon forget his blessings. And then the doubts start coming in. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do, Brother Nelson. I don't know what I'm going to do, Sister Mary. Sheila, I don't know what I'm going to pray for me. Help me. I don't know what I, I'm just all mixed up. And then we look at that person's life and we say, well, wait a minute. Didn't God just deliver you out of something a year ago? And if he did it, then he could do it again. But even though we say that, we go through it too, don't we? I have to think back. And, and I, we have to, you have to do this. We've got to get a little book and start writing down all our blessings that we can remember. And from here on, put down every blessing. So when we get discouraged, we don't do this. Oh, look how many times he did it. Look how many times he saved me. Look how many times he delivered me. Look how many times he's healed me. Look how many times he's got me out of a jam. I have nothing to worry. But within hours after feeding the multitude, the disciples started to worry. Why the disciples were men like us. But Jesus said, we're going on the other side. They started to go to the other side. Jesus went off on the mountain to pray. Sometimes we need to go off to the mountain to pray. We need to get off by ourselves and pray. So the disciples are by themselves going to the other side. And look at verse 16 of chapter 6 of John. And when he was now come, his disciples went down to the sea and entered into a ship. And they went over the sea towards Caprium. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not with them. Remember, Jesus went away to, to pray. And it says here in 18, And the sea arose by reason. In other words, there was a great wind that blew. In other words, what was happening was getting very rough, and it was getting very high, and the wind was blowing. And 19 says, And when they had rowed about 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs, that's about 3 to 4 miles, that's all they rode. It was just three or four miles is all they went. They saw Jesus walking in the sea, drawing near to the ship. They were afraid. I preached this so many times, and I preached it to somebody just yesterday, mm -hmm. talking to them. God is in every storm. I don't care how dark, how miserable, how black it is. God is in every storm. Amen. Amen. If we don't see him, we just need to look a little harder. Lord Sometimes Lord. we need to say, God... I don't see, but I know you're here. Because you said you'd never leave me or forsake me. So no matter how bad the storm is, I know that you're here. Gloria. You're here, God. I'm just going to look a little harder to see you. I'm going to trust a little bit more. I'm going to pray a little bit more. I'm going to get into the Word a little bit more. Because you're in the storm. And your Word says that if I seek you, I shall find you. You're in the storm. And all of a sudden you see a little light. Maybe completely, that whole wall could be completely dark, pitch black, but there's like a little pin light that's up there in the corner. And you know what that is? That's the light of Christ. And then it starts getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And the brighter it gets and the closer it gets to you, then our confidence seems to go back to, I don't know what I was worried about. Lord, I knew you were here all the time. And the reality is, he is in every storm. Listen to what he says to the disciples. This is for you and I today through the storms that you're going through. It is I! Be not afraid. Richard, I'm in your storm. That's what God is saying. Daniel, I'm in your storm. That's what God is saying. Jose, God is saying, I'm in your storm. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God is in your storm. Hallelujah. God is in your storm, Sister Amen. God is in your storm, Sister Mary. Amen. Sister Carol, Brother Tony, God is in your storm. Amen. God is in our storm. Amen. Then they willingly, say willingly. Willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship 
was at the land whither they went. I'm discovering more and more this past couple of years from my own life. I have to speak personally. I've had to stand up and rebuke storms in my life. I've had to rebuke hell out of my life. That's why many a time I'll say, you know, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of God. And the gates of hell will try to push itself against you. It comes on like a flood. It comes on like a flood. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God shall raise up a standard. And that standard is us. That standard is his people. So when the gates of hell come up, and, and I started to think at one time as a new Christian, a young Christian, that when he said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of God, and that's against Jesus. Jesus is the, uh, the, 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 our cornerstone. He is the church itself. But the church, I started to think of the young man, well, it's the church, the building, and it's the people in the church, and that was all part of it. It's Jesus. That's all part of it. But we have to remember, who makes up the body of Christ? You do. Amen. I do. We are the church of the God. So it'd be nice if all of us would stand up today in the front and just hold our hands out and rebuke the storms in our life, in each other's mm. lives. But you know what? Sometimes we have to be like Jesus. It could be one person, one person standing up and rebuking the storm. It might just be you alone. But you're not alone. Say, God, it's you and me, buddy. Oh, yes. I can't do it. But you can. That's right. Use me as the conduit. Use me as, as the connection point. Use me. Amen. So in one hand, his power comes through you. In the other hand, the power of God comes forth. Amen. It's not us. It's him. Amen. It's not us. It's him. It's not us. It's him. Praise God. We have to remember our place. We are his children. We are his hands and feet and mouthpiece, but all power comes from him. Yes. But if we don't know him, we have no power. Mm -hmm. We can scream Jesus all day long. Nothing's going to happen. How many people understand that? Amen. The promises of God are yes and amen, but those promises are to the world. Those promises are to who? His children. His children, church. I pray that, you know, it's, it's funny, you come to church and, and all this has happened to everybody, God has a certain message to present, and, it, and God changes in the spur of the moment. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing, praise God. Because God knows who's there to hear a message. I pray that you understand that we are God's hands and feet and mouth. I want you to understand when you leave here that you are the church. You can hold out that hand and say, peace be still. I want you to understand the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Almighty God. I want you to understand that the troubles you're going through aren't because of you sometimes. The troubles you're going through are just the fact we're in a fallen world. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, and the sun is showing to shine on the just and the unjust. So when we have problems, it's not that we're doing anything wrong. It's just the way it is. But because we have the problems, and Jesus warned us this a number of times. He said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. He didn't say in the world to come, in the world that may be, in the future world. He said, in this, this world, right now world, you're going to have tribulation. He didn't say you're going to have some troubles. He didn't say you're going to have some infirmities. He said tribulation. You know what tribulation means? It means the dam has busted and there's a flood coming. All hell has broken loose. You're going to have tribulation in this world. And then we go, wow, Jesus, thanks for that good news. That makes me feel really good. We're going to have all kinds of problems. But he also says, be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. Glory. And if he overcame the world, the Bible tells us that we are overcomers. Mm. Because he's an overcomer. Yes. Why? Because we belong to him. We're connected to the vine. We're connected to the branch. We're connected to the tree. We're connected to the where the power comes from. Maybe we ought to get a fake outlet up here. Maybe just have Brother Al put a fake outlet in. And we just take a little cord and we get plugged in to the right outlet. When you're plugged into the right outlet and the switch is turned on, guess what? We have juice. And that juice is the power of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, the joy, the peace. We get that if we're connected to Him. 
But if we're not connected to him, guess what? We don't have it. So for those that are watching today, if you want to know that joy and peace and that power we spoke of, come to know the one that you all have met. Come to know the one that we call Jesus. Come to know Amen. the one that's the Lord of Lords Hallelujah. and the King of Kings. Come to know the one that is the beginning and the end. Come to know Hallelujah. the one that is the Alpha and the Omega. Come to know the one that is the healer, the deliverer. Come to know one that's the one that sticks with me closer to your brother. Come to know the one that's my Heavenly Father. Come to know and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life. When you do that, that's when changes are going to happen in your life. Until you do that, you can be you'll go through the same nonsense for years and years and years and years until you're old and gray and maybe you're not here anymore. Receive him. Receive him as Lord and Savior. There's never a better time. The Word of God says that today is the day of salvation. You want to get close to God? Get closer to Him. Well, that's for the Christian man and woman too. Get closer to Him. I want a closer walk. I'm like Brother Charles. I want to be able to walk so close, Sister Mary, that we're just walking all of a sudden. We're gone. Not because God has wrecked her. Not. We're gone because he took us early. We want to be like Enoch. Their sister Sheila, and all of a sudden she's gone. Brother Richard, he's gone. Our sister, she's gone. God just says, I'm taking you right now. Hey, I'm going to close that with this. Keep Brother Mike. Again, keep his brother in prayer. Keep uh, Brother Eddie Omen in Glory prayer and their family. Keep all the other uh, ones that we spoke of in prayer. Keep, keep Sister Sheila and her mother in prayer too, yes. And her son in prayer this week, praise God. Keep Sister Carol in prayer. Tomorrow's her surgery. Everything's going to be okay, Carol. It's going to be okay. We all stand.